Thank you very much for that generous uh, introduction. No wonder I feel tired. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, ADA and the Lean Foundation and the Forget Us Not Foundation for sponsoring um, uh, the trip for Peter and I to be here with you today. And it's rather incredible for me to see such a large group of people coming out on a Saturday. Peter said to me just a few minutes ago, I must really love you to give my weekends up for you all the time. <laughs> so I changed the title of my speech last night after talking to uh, members um, over dinner last night. I just made a few changes this morning. So I want you to rethink um, dementia. Just very briefly, the global statistics, the WHO announced earlier this year that there are uh, an estimated 50 million people with dementia globally. There is one new diagnosis every 3.2 seconds somewhere in the world. Um, it's a terminal progressive chronic illness. There is currently no cure, not even on the horizon, and there are no disease-modifying drugs. Um, and I believe that we need to change the post-diagnostic model of care for people with dementia so that we can support them to live with it, not just to die from it. That's just an infographic from Alzheimer's Disease International. It gives you a bit of a global picture of where we're at. If dementia was an economy, it would be the largest country in the world. So there are a number of, well, there's a medical definition of dementia. That's the definition from the Mayo Clinic. Um, dementia is a syndrome in which there is deterioration in memory, thinking, uh, and other domains of cognitive capacity. The next image I've put up is a graphic from my second book, and it shows that dementia itself is just an umbrella term, um, in the same way that the word car or fruit is used. And there are lots of different categories of dementia, and then even subcategories within, for example, Alzheimer's disease. There are different types of Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. There are different types of frontotemporal dementia. Um, so that's just a, a kind of to explain that dementia is a very complicated condition. Next definition of dementia is actually from one of the co-founders of uh, Dementia Alliance International, and he talks about people with dementia, we're just changing in ways that you are not, but you're changing as well. We're all changing, but people with dementia maybe are changing differently to you, and that we need you to support our disabilities so that we're enabled to live positive lives rather than further disabled. Another image from my second book, which is really to try and get the message across that dementia is much, much more than memory loss. One of the myths in the community is that uh, it's all memory loss, and, and that myth is actually kept alive by having memory clinics, memory cafes, memory walks, and so on. But depending on which area of your brain is affected as to which capacity is going to be affected, um, and certainly for me, memory loss was not the first feature of my dementia. So it's much more than memory. And I won't, because I can't, without turning my head, I can't um, read that out. It's difficult not having slides in front of me. But definition three, Dr. Alan Power uh, uh, is a consultant geriatrician. Uh, he's primarily a consultant now working for aged care facilities and also an author and international speaker. And that's his definition of dementia. Dementia is a shift in the way a person sees the world around him or her. And I rather like that definition as well. But I'd like to talk about dementia, and I'd like to think about the me in the word dementia, because too often people think about the symptoms and not the person. So there's a little collage of images from my life. I was a farm kid, grew up on a remote farming property um, in South Australia. Um, I've also been a nurse. I've worked in operating theatres. I've worked in a dementia ward. Uh, I am a member of the World Dementia Council. I helped Alzheimer's Australia spearhead their Fight Dementia campaign a few years ago. That was my first ever political rally, probably my last. <laughs> I'm not very much into politics. But there's a lot more to people with dementia than their dementia. So dementia from the inside out, what was it like being diagnosed at the age of 49? Um, Probably to say it was hideous is an understatement, perhaps one of the century. 
Um, I was in shock. I cried for weeks. Our youngest son, who was doing his last year at school, um, laughingly said to me, but mum, isn't that a funny old person's disease? And we did laugh, even though it wasn't very funny. Um, my mother was, felt an anger, she said, that she'd never felt before to have her daughter diagnosed with dementia and the thought of perhaps finding a nursing home for me rather than for her. So it was very traumatic for my parents, even though they didn't talk about it very much. Uh, for my husband, also uh, lovingly known around the world as my bub or my backup brain, um, I think it was deeply traumatic for him. And uh, um, I found him sitting on the steps, the ones I fell down when I couldn't make the last trip here, um, with his head in his hands crying a few years ago. And I, I thought there must have been a death in the family. And I said to him, what's wrong? And he looked up and he said, I know I'm losing you and I'm afraid of what the future holds. So whilst it appears that we're living really positively, in the beginning, it wasn't positive at all. It was a really difficult, challenging, dark time for all of us. Um, but you might be wondering what did happen to my brain. Um, I, I can guarantee that the first symptoms that I had, I didn't expect it to be memory. I had what's called an acquired dyslexia. I suddenly was seeing a couple of colour sets back to front, which did make driving particularly difficult because I was seeing red and green back to front. So I was driving through red lights and throwing on the, slamming on the brakes at green lights. Um, and I was not able to spell that. And I'd been very good at maths and spelling. Couldn't do simple maths anymore. I was really getting confused about word use and spelling um, and having to look up meanings even of the word psychology, even though I was doing a psychology degree. So it was very confusing for me that these changes ended up being related to dementia. I'd had brain surgery two or three years before for something unrelated to dementia and I thought they were just a side effect of the brain surgery. So after two or three years of testing um, by a neurologist, I was very shocked to find out that without memory loss, I had dementia. Um, what happened to me and what generally happens to people in the, around the world is that we are told at no matter what stage of dementia we're diagnosed with, we're told to get our end of life affairs in order. If we're younger, we're told to give up work. Um, in my case, I was told to give up study because that would be too stressful for someone with dementia. Um, I was told to give my, get my end of life affairs in order and to get ready for aged care, including going to daycare a day a month to get used to it. Um, I ended up giving that a trademarked term called prescribed disengagement because even though my doctor said there was nothing he could do, there was no medication he could give me, he then referred me to service providers in the community. They're the ones who told me that there was nothing that I could do. Um, so no sense of a future. The cost of that prescribed disengagement is a sense of hopelessness hopelessness of not seeing my grandchildren, a hopelessness for my husband of not having his wife around or not remembering him, a hopelessness and no sense of a good and positive future. It further disables and disempowers people. It does tell people. When, when we went to Living With Memory Loss course, I was told to give up. My husband was actually told to take over that I would, he would soon need to give up work and do everything for me. That further disempowered and disabled me. So it took us a couple of years to work out that I was better off being supported to do things for myself. And I do think that it's a tragedy or a travesty that people only see the deficits of people with dementia. They forget to see what we can still do. Um, and that image is a little bit confronting perhaps for some people, but it kind of shows how it felt in those early days. People only saw the dementia. They didn't see that I was still a mother, a wife, a brother, a sister, an auntie, um, an employee in the beginning. So I see that uh, we need to see, think differently about dementia and instead of seeing dementia as just a pathway towards deficits and death, see the symptoms of dementia as disabilities. 
And 12 months ago at the, WH, at the WHO in Geneva at the Mental Health Gap Forum, I advocated pretty strongly for, we come under mental health at the WHO, even though dementia is not a mental illness, it's a neurological disorder. Um, and I campaigned pretty hard and Autism International joined us uh, and they now have a, a fourth subcategory under mental health. So under the mental health umbrella at the WHO, they have mental illness, intellectual disabilities, psychosocial disabilities, and they've added in a new domain of cognitive disabilities for people with dementia or autism. Um, so we need to see, see and manage the symptoms as disabilities. So that's my definition of dementia, which is kind of a, a, a combination of the de definition two and three. And I believe that we need to redefine dementia away from the medical, pure medical model. So as Ricardo, I think that's your name, yes, said, I am busy and I've had some girlfriends call me uh, Action Barbie. Um, so I didn't even like Barbie when I was a kid. If those of you who know what the Barbie doll was, I thought dolls were pretty boring. I was into teddy bears. Um, and I have a to-do list that's about 500 miles long. Um, I don't know how, whether I'll ever finish my to-do list, but it's a very long to-do list. So one of the big changes for me was that I was at university and I stayed at university even though I'd been advised to give up by my neuropsychologist he, thinking it would be too stressful for me. I guess he forgot to read the uh, data on neuroplasticity. Um, and I'd been reading Norman Doidge's book and other um, information on neuroplasticity and believed that if I stayed studying, maybe I could change the pathways in my brain. My psychology lecturer said to me, what would you give up university for? You're doing that for fun. It was a, like a midlife crisis. I always wanted to go to uni, so I was doing that in my 40s. Um, she said, we've got a whole disability support team that can support your disabilities. There's no need for you to give up. And so I uh, got a letter from my neurologist. He outlined the type of dementia I had. He outlined the symptoms that I was currently experiencing at that time. We then set up a disability support plan. Um, and every three months we reviewed that because obviously dementia is a progressive illness. So I get new disabilities or disabilities change. But that's allowed me to keep living a really productive and meaningful life for me. I know there's not a lot of people that consider studying fun, but I actually really enjoy it. So most universities, I think, around the world would have a disability um, support service. And I, certainly if one of our children had had dyslexia, we wouldn't have not sent them to school. The school would have provided them support for their dyslexia. So by not using a deficits-based approach to living with dementia, I was able to find hope again, as were my children and as was my husband. I could see a sense and feel hope for a future, even though it was vastly different to the one that I might have been having or thinking I was having. Um, I certainly didn't think that I'd be standing in front of five or 600 people in Singapore talking about living with dementia. That was never on my bucket list, guarantee it. Even though it's a delight to be here and you're very generous um, hosts, thank you. Um, it wasn't on my bucket list to get dementia and be in Singapore speaking. But, you know, it's become a necessary change in my life and um, I might as well enjoy as much of it as I can. And I do believe there is a systemic and gross underestimation of the capacity of all people with dementia, even in the later stages. And I'll tell a very quick story of when I was first nursing. When I finished my training and moved to the city, uh, which was much smaller than Singapore, Adelaide, um, I worked in Adelaide's first dedicated dementia ward. And there was a lady there that the senior staff told me was mute. Don't waste your time on Nellie. She can't talk. She can't communicate. She doesn't understand you. And I, took a, I had, had a real soft spot for this lady and did as much of the tasks as I could on my shifts. And I was in the washroom with her one day. Um, and I, I don't know, any nurses in the room or hospital workers? It's a busy job, OK? It is busy being a nurse. And I had a lot of things to do that day. And I said to Nellie, not unkindly, but Nellie, could you hurry up and have a wee? And she looked at me and she winked and she said, do you think you could have a wee for yourself? 
And I said, I knew you were in there. Why won't you talk? She said, the rest of the staff treat me like I'm an idiot. Why would I waste my breath? So there was an example of a lady who'd been labelled mute as unable to communicate. And you know, for the time I stayed working there, she only talked to me in the toilet or the shower. <laughs> she didn't talk to anybody else ever. Um, and nobody believed me that she could talk. So I think there's an example, it was a really good example at an early age as a nurse to not just believe the labels that people were being given in aged and dementia care. So I'm still me. Even though I've got dementia, I'm still me. And everyone living in Singapore with dementia, they are still themselves. They are still people with humanity, with feelings, who need love and affection. We in our family use humour quite a lot. I don't know if anyone here has heard of the Three Stooges. Um, uh, my husband uh, quite eloquently described having dementia in our relationship like having a third person in the relationship, um, not in a kinky way. Um, and we, I ended up giving this threesome a label of the Three Stooges and we call dementia Larry. And there are days when I get really cranky about having dementia and instead of feeling angry at myself for not being able to do something, I can yell at Larry. And instead of Peter getting cross with me for sometimes asking the same question, or not remembering where we're going, he can get cross at Larry instead of me. And he says that it's not my fault that I've got dementia. So the changes caused by dementia are dementia's fault. It's not anything I'm trying to do to annoy him or the kids. But there are days that I spend just walking around in circles. Um, I've had people sometimes ask me, uh, you know, I was a very good multitasker before dementia, and, uh, and quest in a question in an audience once, someone said to me, well, what's it really like having dementia? Um, and, well, most women in the room, especially if you've had children, you're used to doing a lot of things at once. So I'll say, it's a bit like becoming a man. I can only do one thing at once, and I often never get it finished. <laughs> So my husband sometimes comes home to four or five cups of cold tea sitting around the house at the end of a day because I make it, I put it away and I forget where I put it. Um, but I'm not just a challenging behaviour, I am still me and often if I'm upset it's not due to the dementia, it's because I'm upset about something caused by the dementia and for people locked away in locked dementia units they probably display all of the symptoms of behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia because they don't like being locked away. Basically, they've had their human rights taken away. Um, I had the pleasure of being in Jakarta recently. I think some people in the room were in Jakarta as well. And um, historically for Indonesia, they had their first person with dementia speak publicly at their international conference. Um, and I'm hoping to help Singapore to empower people with dementia in Singapore to become active self-advocates and to be at hopefully the 2020 conference here uh, in a few years. And it'll be a great joy for me to see people with dementia from Singapore standing up here speaking and not me. Um, so the future of dementia does need to include human rights. And I'll explain a little bit about why. In 2015, as uh, then I was co-chair of Dementia Alliance International, I was invited to the WHO First Ministerial Conference on Dementia and at two o'clock in the morning uh, of day two, the day I was speaking, I changed my pre-approved speech to a new speech and didn't get approval for it. And I made those three demands in my speech that we have uh, a human rights and more ethical approach to dementia with better post-diagnostic support that includes rehabilitation and disability support that we are treated with the same human rights under the CRPD as everybody else with a disability, and that research for a cure, um, yes, that's essential, but we have a balance of research for improving care as well, um, and also now risk reduction research is becoming very um, prevalent. So from there, um, I, after that, I read the 2015 OECD report 
which actually um, concluded that dementia receives the worst treatment of any illness in the developed world um, in 2015, which was very sobering for me because I live in a country that's considered one of the developed world countries. Um, but it also confirmed why rehabilitation and CRPD is important for people with dementia. We need a human rights-based approach. We're still applying late-stage disease management to earlier stage diagnosis. So in the 70s when I nursed most of our patients with dementia and even in residential care, they were called patients, not clients or people, um, they were all late stage, so they were quite advanced. Their symptoms were very um, uh, developed and they did need to get their end of life affairs in order and they did need care. Um, but now people like me are being diagnosed much, much earlier in the disease, but we're still being told to go home and get ready to die. So we need to change that, um, is in my opinion. DAI um, in 2015 launched, and I've got a lot of copies out there for people who might like to take them away. We wrote a, a brief uh, publication on why we need human rights in dementia. Um, and we are updating that for next year, but it's a, a very brief overview of why human rights are important in dementia. Um, ADI have had a global charter for uh, people with dementia for many years, actually, and their global charter is, I can live well with dementia. So yet nowhere in the world are people telling us how to do that. And that was one of the things that fired me up. I read this charter and went, well... How come people aren't helping me do that? Why aren't people proactively supporting people to live well with dementia? So these are, you know, this is in line with human rights and I've listed some of the articles that are relevant, the articles of the Convention of Rights of Persons with Dementia and why they're relevant to dementia care. In, uh, in 2014, um, the WHO also launched a disability action plan um, and that clearly states that CRPD um, really must be reflected in national dementia strategies and pol policies because on the WHO dementia page, it says one sentence in bold, dementia um, is the highest cause of disability of any all, per all older persons. I can't remember the exact quote, but dementia is the cause of most disability of all persons. Um, older persons. So we must see the symptoms of dementia as disabilities and manage them accordingly. The WHO Global Action Plan um, for Dementia was unanimously adopted around the world this year at the World Health Assembly in May, which I attended. Um, I'm not sure countries really understand what they've signed on to because there are some cross-cutting principles that relate to human rights for people with dementia and people like me are going to be asking countries to become accountable in their national plans about making sure that we have human rights and um, a, a national plan that is in line with CRPD principles. Uh, we also need to focus, uh, the World Dementia Council has got five domains that they're focusing on. Uh, one of them is on risk reduction. Um, and we firmly believe um, that it, through risk reduction strategies in countries, we will maybe reduce the predicted prevalence of dementia. Um, the predicted pre prevalence is pretty scary if we do nothing. Um, and whilst there's no cure or disease modifying drugs, at least if we can focus on risk reduction and the evidence is pretty strong in, in the risk reduction, um, like we did with heart disease, like we did with um, diabetes, we will reduce the prevalence. Oh, I forgot to put the title on that page. That's my dream list for what I want for a post-diagnostic pathway of support for people with dementia. I'm, I apologise, I left the title off. Um, but I, it's a disability and social model of support. Um, timely diagnosis is a human rights issue. So there are countries where maybe you don't, you know, less than 10% of people get a diagnosis. So that's a major human rights issue. In my country, 50% of us get a diagnosis, but we still just get told to go home and die. That's a human rights issue. Um, I want to be all people to be treated as if they've had an acquired brain injury, to receive authentic acquired brain injury rehabilitation, which I would have been given had I had a stroke, not dementia. 
Um, I want a speech pathologist for all people with dementia when they're diagnosed, not when they're nearly dead and can't swallow. It's a bit late then. Um, I would like there to be community-based rehabilitation, uh, grief and loss counselling because the grief of losing capacity is actually quite painful and to have unresolved grief can actually cause cognitive changes uh, and apathy and depression. So if we can better manage the grief that people with dementia experience, then they may have a more positive experience of dementia. I want people who are younger, like me, to be supported to, be, uh, to continue to work in the same way that I would have been had I had a stroke or a road accident. I would have been supported, if possible, to go back to being a paid employee paying taxes to my government. Um, and I have a human right to that, actually. So um, yesterday I brought up in the round table discussion uh, uh, the comment that we want community-based rehabilitation. That's just a brief explanation of it. The aim of it is rehabilitation to help people with disabilities to maintain function and uh, continue to living as well as possible. So, so it's not rehabilitation in the sense of a cure, in the sense of a, you're going to go back to what you were before your acquired disability. It's that rehabilitation that you can have that supports you to keep living a good life. For I look, you know, it's a bit like, um, I, I don't look like I've got dementia and I don't sound like dementia, but nobody in this room looks like they've got diabetes or heart disease or cancer either. Um, my husband was taking a photograph of me once and said, why don't you look like you've got dementia? So I kind of pulled this really stupid face and then that got tweeted around the world. Um, but there isn't a look to dementia. Um, but underneath the surface, what I'm doing is what that swan's doing to stay afloat. I'm paddling like crazy using lots of disability support strategies to keep speaking and to keep functioning. I use a lot of um, what I listed uh, many years ago as non-pharmacological interventions for dementia. Um, I use study um, to help create new pathways in my brain and my last lot of imaging and neuropsych testing actually show improvement in my left temporal lobe testing. So my neurologist at home has now got some sense that what I'm doing is the right thing to be doing. Um, Professor Dale Bredesen, um, I don't know if anyone here, anyone who's working in dementia should read Professor Dale Bredesen's book on reversing mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's and a lot of that risk reduction evidence, he's doing it through lifestyle changes, dietary changes and nutritional support um, and he's had 200 cases of reversing dementia and is going on to a major clinical trial at the Cleveland Clinic in the USA. Um, so I strongly recommend anyone working in dementia to get a copy of that book. Um, these are the positive psychosocial interventions that I use in that, you know, we have to use terms like therapy and interventions to get funding in Australia. Um, so I use those terms in slides. Um, but things like laughter, things like nurturing relationships, many of us have the experience of long-time family and friends kind of quietly walking away from us. And that's what happened to people with cancer in the 70s. They were stigmatised, they were discriminated, their families didn't visit them, they were fearful of cancer. That's where dementia is now. We need to get rid of that fear of dementia. We need to come back. People with dementia actually need you to visit them more often than you used to, not less often. We're, we're not that scary. Um, when I don't do all of those things, if we go on a pure holiday, it feels like I'm drowning. It's like the swan stopping paddling. My symptoms actually take over and within two or three days, I have trouble remembering my husband's name or what the cutlery is or where we're going. And so it's actually better for people with dementia to be supported to work harder to maintain independence rather than taken over from them and do for them. Uh, just a couple of slides on kindness. It was a really interesting article came out this year, and kindness is free, so it's really easy to do. Um, the statistical evidence about the value of kindness is actually significantly uh, similar to the uh, evidence of giving up smoking um, in male mortality. 
It's quite an interesting piece for anyone who wants to look it up. Um, also with dementia, and I know Francis and some others um, working with AD, ADA, ADA um, we're talking about language. It's really important to use respectful language for people with dementia. We don't like to be collectively labelled as sufferers. We really dislike being called demented. We are people living with dementia. Um, sometimes it's not fun, sometimes it's an okay experience. But before dementia, I had good and bad days, so it's not much different now to what it was then. And Dementia Australia used to be called Alzheimer's Australia. They've got the most comprehensive language guidelines. So if you work in the sector, um, I do recommend downloading them. Um, this is what people with dementia think of secure dementia units. We stopped uh, segregating Negro Americans in the 50s, and that's, a, that's an image from Hidden Figures, the movie Hidden Figures, of the three black women who were really the power brains trust behind America getting their first rocket into space. Um, and I took a photograph of that sign, it's Kevin Costner, the actor, uh, smashing down the coloured toilet sign. Um, the only other people in society that we lock away are convicted criminals. So I'm not sure why we've chosen to segregate and lock up people with dementia. We, we people with dementia, believe that the world needs to find a better way to support us so that you don't have to lock us up. Safety is what we want for those we love. Autonomy is what we want for ourselves. And I know that Peter and I did put three people with dementia. Uh, we had to put them into nursing homes in Australia because we didn't feel able to support them at home or they couldn't be supported in the homes they were living in. And we both feel quite a lot of guilt for having done that. Um, but then when I got dementia, I certainly went, well, I don't want to be locked up either. So my um, close family friend, Barry, who had dementia, when he was made to go into a nursing home, he felt like he'd been separated from the woman he loved. So of course he was unhappy all the time and trying to escape to go home to the woman he loved, his wife. Um, that wasn't dementia. That was being put in a nursing home and being locked up. So just one comment about dementia friendly. I mean, of course we want everyone to be friendly, but I'd like the dementia friendly community initiatives to change from just dementia friendly and awareness to proper inclusion and accessible communities. So I don't want to be put away in a, in a dementia cafe. I want to be able to go to a cafe where anybody goes. And I know that the cafe staff will know how to support me with cognitive disabilities. I don't want to go to a centre with just other people with dementia. I want to go and study, or maybe it's play golf, or maybe it's go to a sewing class, or go to bowls, or go to the movies. So rather than developing centres to further segregate people, maybe we need to make our communities accessible and inclusive for all people with dementia. So Dementia Alliance International grew from eight people with dementia wanting to have an authentic voice and not having other people tell us how we felt and what was best for us. We are exclusive club now, you have to have dementia to join us. And we've actually had some people without dementia so they almost wish they could get dementia to join our club. <laughs> uh, we've got members in 44 countries now. Our youngest member is an 18 year old lad in Kenya. Our oldest member is a 93-year-old lady living in a nursing home. She's so bored and lonely in the nursing home, she joins our online support groups. We run weekly support groups in a number of different time zones. Uh, we have once a month educational cafes, uh, educational webinars that anyone can t attend with professional speakers. Uh, we have monthly cafes that are just a social get-together for people with dementia from all around the world. Um, and we are growing fairly rapidly, so it'd be great to see Dementia Alliance um, with members from Singapore, and we'd love to support people here. Lessons from dementia. Dementia's taught me a lot. Uh, it's actually probably given me the greatest pain, emotional pain, than I've ever had before. Um, and I'd been through a lot of life experiences and other illness, but it's also been my third greatest gift in life, and ironically, it's given me a clarity about life that I didn't have before. And I don't sweat the small stuff anymore. I have learnt to live that 
today could be my last day, so I've got to live the best, to the best of my ability today, just in case it is my last one. And we all should live like that, and time's up, I've been told. Um, luckily, that's my last slide, so thank you very much for having me. So one question at one time. Could, could I just see, uh, see, uh, see some hands? All right, we've got some hands at the front, perhaps the gentleman uh, right at the back, sir. Can you please explain the disease and the person? And how does family look after it? So, just clarify the question. You're saying that uh, dementia is a disease and not a person. And your question is to ask Kate to uh, clarify how the, the family can work on uh, supporting the person. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, so I, I think that's really what's behind my see the symptoms of dementia as disabilities and support the person with dementia to maintain independence for as long as possible. And obviously when the disease progresses to later stage, then um, independence probably won't be possible. But in the earlier days, we haven't been supporting people to maintain independence. We've been taking over from people, which further disables them. And you were, you were, we were just talking a little bit earlier, Kate, about how even the terminology of, let's say, caregiver versus care partner, uh, the term caregiver has this idea of one, one gives and the other one takes. But actually, this, this independence um, is important. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's why I initially nicknamed my husband my backup brain. So just like you back up your computer, you only go to the backup when the computer crashes. So I can't even use a calculator anymore. Well, that used to make me really upset. Now I just go, well, I can ring my backup brain and he can work the maths out for me. Um, or luckily I can still type and software on com a computer does the automatic spell check and corrects things for me. Or the only time my husband would step in is if it was dangerous. So because I see signs and things sometimes back to front, I might go to cross a, a road that's a one-way road and I'll look the wrong way so, that, so I think there's no traffic coming but actually there's all these cars coming so I would hope that, and Peter has actually stopped me from being run over three times, but that's the only time he steps in unless I ask him. And I think being a care partner supporting me to maintain independence has really helped us navigate away from him taking over me always needing help because there's lots of times I don't need help or I can use support like I use my, my uh, alarm bell on my phone a lot I've got laminated sheets around the house that can help me maybe when I've forgotten how to use the coffee machine I can read the, sh the laminated sheet that's stuck on the wall next to the coffee machine and I, I, and I can look at the sign at the front door that says don't forget to take your keys your walking stick, and all the things that you take with you, with you when you leave the house. But if I didn't have those things, I'd probably need Peter at home to do that for me. But using strategies, and some of them are really simple, like a laminated sheet, really simple strategies to maintain independence. Thank you for that very practical tip. We've got a, two questions over there. Does the dimension people prefer more social gathering parties or more quiet time to themselves? Is it a personal preference or is it a... I, I think it's a personal yeah. preference. Um, uh, I'm a relatively social person. Um, my husband wasn't, so he's now had to become one. Uh, <laughs> um, he, but I find now in social occasions, I find it much more difficult to keep up with conversations. I find it much, much more difficult to... Uh, know what to respond to questions to when there's a lot of noise going on. My paddling's harder, but it's very individual. Some people, like I do like quiet time as well. So probably if I was forced to live in a nursing home, I wouldn't like that. I'd want to just stay in my re room and read a book all day or listen to music. I'd probably be non-compliant because I wasn't joining in the activities room. So it's very individual. Um, some people like quiet time, some people don't. Uh, I'm just curious, Kate, like what motivated you to come out from a prescribed disengagement to an active engagement? So what was your motivation or inspiration? 
Um, I was doing a couple of subjects in my Bachelor of Arts degree. One was a digital storytelling course and one was a journalism travel writing uh, unit. And at the time I hadn't been diagnosed for very long and the, the, my head was spinning really with all I could think of was dementia. And I asked the lecturer, instead of like visiting a new town and then coming back and writing a travel journalistic piece on it, could I write about this new place in my head called dementia? So I wrote this story called Dementia, my story, um, or my world, my new world. Um, it then got published in a magazine back in Australia. Um, then I started to be asked to come and talk about my story. I was so nervous the first time I did it, I asked somebody to read the story and then I answered questions. So it's been a very accidental journey to where I am now. A question from the front, the two ladies. I would like to ask, what first realised that you should go and get yourself diagnosed? Uh, and I put on the early in the slides, I put up that I couldn't spell that. I didn't think I was going to be told I had dementia. When I first talked to the doctor about cognitive changes, I was a little bit lucky in that I was seeing a neurologist following up from the brain surgery, and I just mentioned to him that I had these strange things happening, that I'd never had dyslexia as a kid, and I'd had almost perfect spelling and maths ability, and suddenly I couldn't spell that, and I couldn't work out how to use the different spellings of there and there, for example. Um, and I was getting eight and nine back to front and colour sets back to front. And I didn't think that was going to be dementia. So when I asked, when I mentioned these symptoms, I thought they were going to be a side effect of the brain surgery. Um, so I, I never ever went, talked to a doctor expecting to be told that I would have dementia. So okay, the discussion today, uh, the main discussion is over, you know, it can strike early, right? Uh, conventional wisdom says, look, above 65, the risk goes up a lot more. But as you were speaking a little bit earlier, um, it probably is happening a lot younger, right? I, I actually suspect it's just that diagnostics is here and awareness has made it more visible to everybody it's much more visible that younger people get dementia now. So I can remember um, hearing from uh, one of the neurologists working at one of the major hospitals in Melbourne. It was about a year and a half after the Fight Dementia campaign, awareness campaign in Australia. And he said, oh, you know, the first six months after that awareness campaign, they were getting 40 or 50 people a day ringing the memory clinic saying, oh, I've been hearing on the radio about memory, I might have younger onset dementia. So it raised awareness, but a lot of those people didn't have dementia, of course. Are there lifestyle factors uh, that, that perhaps put you at risk? Well, uh, well, there are. I mean, one of the types of dementia um, is caused from alcoholism. And uh, in fact, if you give up drinking, I think you can reverse that um, dementia somewhat. Um, but lifestyle factors like Exercise, uh, nutrition, um, so healthy nutrition, not too much sugar and bad fats and those sorts of things. Um, Dr. Bredesen, I think, is very much into the ketogenic diet. Um, new learning is uh, important and uh, remaining socialised. So social isolation is a risk factor for dementia. Yeah. I saw a hand uh, at the back. Uh, my dad is 87 years old. And um, for the last five years, there were all these things that's happening to him that we had no idea. So I just want to say thank you. You know, he, he stopped reading. His mathematical functions just kind of, he, he did mental mathematics. You know, <laughs> it was like you, he was just really great with math. And then, um, and then he stopped reading. The last six months has been really difficult. So my question is, you talked about this community, you know, um, I think that's, I, I like to think of myself as first responders, you know, kind of like, you know, that if I could be trained um, in, in a way that would not only to serve the patient, I, I came back from the UK and all I did was, how can I give my dad 
the, you know, his, the way he's living his life, how can I give him access to continue to live his life the way he wants to live his life? So he's got an iPal, someone who comes and takes him out for a walk, keeps him company. He goes to Nick, everything. But this last six months has been particularly challenging because I had no idea that the reading, you know, <laughs> that that's... Um, so, so all this thing about, you know, having the community uh, look out for him, I was at a, 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 conf not a, a talk last week about, you know, co community stepping out support. I, I think that's really great. You know, it's, it's awesome to have that as for inclusive society. Um, but at 87, um, I, I, as a first responder, I, I want to know things like that, you know. So I wanted. Uh, it, especially, you know, like in Singapore, how do we give people more access to this kind of information? So, you, you, you know, like, you, you know, okay, this is the turning point is happening here. So, I don't know how, what you would say in, in terms of support. I think in every country, it's going to be a different answer to that question. Um, I think that the dementia-friendly communities campaigns can do a lot, but I think they need to change away from just awareness and just dementia-friendly um, and move towards truly inclusive and accessible communities. Um, but volunteer programs could be really important, and I was talking um, yesterday about volunteering programs, some of the programs in Australia that have been really successful. Um, the, a life care, which is an aged care provider in Australia, did a side-by-side -side project with people with dementia and a major hardware chain called Bunnings. And the people with dementia were trained up to go and do volunteering at Bunnings. And the Bunnings, all the Bunnings staff were given some basic education uh, in dementia. And they were meant to be buddied with a staff member for the whole time they were on. They were doing like full day shifts. Um, some of them three times a week, and within two or three weeks, the person with dementia didn't need the buddy. The person with dementia was selling product and doing stuff in the gardening shop. And um, there's been a few projects like that in Australia where volunteering programs can really help get people with dementia out. There's an art, uh, yes, there's an art program in in Sydney at the moment where people with dementia are actually being trained up to be the tour guides. So not going on a tour of the art gallery they're taking the tours. Um, so I think that we need to uh, just, I, I don't know if I've answered your question, in fact, I've almost forgotten the question, but um, I guess it's a stepping stone for every community. Um, one small thing a community could do would, might be to make signage clearer for people with dementia. Um, just really simple things you can do that don't cost a lot of money. And with regards to, to Singapore, our next speaker will be sharing a bit more about living with dementia in Singapore, okay? Uh, just so for Kate to, I think we've got time for perhaps the last two questions. So I've got one question here and I'll take a question from, from the back. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about three, right? The gentleman here, the gentleman there and the one at the back. So we'll go one by one. I'm trying to grasp what is actually the cause of uh, dementia because like what you say, it's uh, alcoholism or Maybe, like what you just mentioned, you have a long to do this, that's why you have a lot of stress, and it's a stress related kind of disease, or is it due to some, I mean, malfunction of the brain? Uh, I'm trying to grasp that. Because uh, you mentioned that in the rehabilitation uh, part, you can use the uh, training, that means you're using the neuroplasticity. And, and on the other hand, you have uh, fresh also that med meditation that comes down your brain. So which uh, direction are we heading towards? Getting the brain more active to recover it or getting the brain more at peace uh, by meditation? I don't think it's that simple. So there's lots of different types of dementias and maybe our next speaker will explain a little bit about that, I'm not sure. But because there are, I don't know, 130 to 200 categories of dementia, so it's not just from alcohol, that's just one type of dementia. Yeah, also so, mentioned about the diet, like uh, sugar, that, is, yeah. it, is it something like a stroke in the brain? Or well, the, the, the risk reduction evidence is pretty clear and lifestyle factors including 
um, healthy diet uh, as part of that evidence. Yes. But it, it's a very co that's a very complicated question with a lot of different answers. I, I'm, I'm not sure I... So the last, last question I want to ask, a personal one, and sometimes I tend to forget uh, where I made my coffee I left there. Is it a sign of <laughs> dementia? Probably it's a normal part of um, age-related memory loss, I'm guessing. <laughs> so like we, our eyes, we need reading glasses ultimately. Um, our skin, I took a photograph of my hand for something recently and I, I was horrified how many wrinkles are on my hand. So, you know, we age and that's normal and there is, I think it's called benign senescent memory loss and that's a normal memory loss that we will all have some changes to our uh, memory capacity as we age, but dementia is not a normal part of ageing. So even at the age of 50, uh, 85, less than 50% of people will have dementia. My question is, uh, how was it being confirmed, as you say, that your problem wasn't caused by the surgery that you had or some drugs that you have taken? I've actually asked my neurologist, does he think that the brain malformation that I was born with and that had caused raised CSF pressure pretty much my whole life until the surgery, um, or whether the surgery could have caused it or whether the anaesthetic drugs could have caused it. That particular year, I had four big operations. Um, there is some emerging evidence about anaesthetic drugs causing dementia, not just making dementia get worse once you're diagnosed. So there's no evidence, really, for me to know why I got um, a temporal lobe dementia. Uh, we have to apologise because we are out of time. Uh, but Kate, I will get you to uh, close with perhaps this final question. You said that when you were first diagnosed, it was a very dark period of your life. Was there a aha moment or a light bulb moment where, where you really sort of figured out that you're going to work it out? How did you sort of get out of that funk? Um, I guess there were a few things that, that helped change that. One was being at university, obviously, um, but what was probably something I've never said in public, but when you get diagnosed with dementia, all of a sudden you beat the statistical odds. If something goes wrong in your family, it's always your fault. If someone forgets their lunchbox, it's mum's fault. Mum's got dementia. And after a while, I got really jacked off with always being the one who was wrong. And I had a bit of a talking to my family about this. And it kind of helped me go, well, of course I'm not the one who's always the reason something went wrong in the family. Um, and that was actually a turnaround for me. I got sick of being the one who was wrong all the time. Um, and of course, the, as statistically impossible. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Kate. It's a bit scary having the last word, actually. <laughs> Although probably my husband would say I always have the last word. Um, um, I, I think that uh, I was a very bad um, participant today in that I forgot to take notes of all the other speakers. Um, and it's getting to the end of the day, so I'm, I can't be very specific about each person's presentation. Um, but I really loved, uh, and I've even forgotten your name, I'm sorry. No, yes. I, f I thought your presentation was amazing, one of the best I've seen in a long time. Um, uh, the next... <laughs> not getting so focused on the medicalization of dementia, but on the social context of it and, and just how important that is for all of us. And really also highlighting for me that how a person with dementia or their family member responds will also be dependent on their personality and, and their, their life experience. And that was a good reminder for me. Um, Hearing uh, other people with dementia was deeply moving for me. Hearing two daughters of um, fathers who are similar age to me uh, was very moving. Um, the 
lady who spoke third, the doc, I think she was a doc, is a doctor. Um, I found her presentation really excellent and very amusing. It was really good fun. Um, but I can't remember enough about it to make detailed comment. But I think overall to see an event like this in Singapore, um, which is really focused on not what's happened before, as Peter said, let's not go back. Even as a family care partner, we have to let go of any guilt that we might feel about how we once looked after someone we loved. And having been in those shoes, worn those shoes, I know how hard that is. But look forward, how can we make change? How can we create change together? How can we always make sure the voices of the people living with dementia in Singapore are being enabled and heard? How can we always make sure the voices of children of Yod are heard. That's not been done well at all in the world um, and is quite a new um, approach and I'm real, I've been trying for that, to, working for that to happen for a long time. Um, let's try and hear the voices of the parents of somebody my age. I know how difficult it was for my mum and dad to have a daughter, a middle-aged daughter diagnosed with dementia. Let's get the voices of older people with dementia or older carers as well. Um, let's get the voices of the professionals, the doctors, the, the staff from ADA or the Lean Foundation. We can't do it on our own. We have to work together. And I think that's been, for me, uh, coming to Singapore, to see you all working together is just so uh, encouraging and heartening for me as a person living with a diagnosis of dementia. So thank you all and everyone for your contribution and for being here today.